All right, so this is called An Unusual Experience with Waska, a lesson from the teacher. And it starts out, years ago, while conducting field work in the Peruvian Amazon as a graduate student, I had, on several occasions, sampled the psychedelic drink ayahuasca under the watchful eyes of mestizo ayahuasqueros. For some reason, however, those early experiences were less than satisfying. A combination of circumstances, including the variable and often weak composition of local brews, a tendency on the part of the presiding shaman to underdose gringo participants, and my own uptight hypervigilance, a defensive posture reflecting my precarious situation as a stranger in a distinctly strange land, had all conspired to keep me from connecting with the ayahuasca experience in Peru, except in the mildest and most superficial manner. I didn't really experience the true profundity of the ayahuasca vision until years later when I attended a conference hosted by the UDV, the Brazilian syncretic religious group that uses ayahuasca ritually in their ceremonies under the name Huasca Vegetal or Chop, which means tea. In 1991, the medical studies group of the UDV organized a scientific conference on Huasca, which was held at a summer retreat a few miles outside Sao Paulo, adjacent to the circular church-like temple, which served as a community and ceremonial center for one of the local UDV nucleos or congregations. A few years previously, I had published several papers on the ayahuasca research I had conducted in Peru in connection with my doctoral research. This work had come to the attention of the UDV, and it was on the strength of this that they kindly extended an invitation to me to attend the Sao Paulo conference and give a talk on the results of my research. The conference was attended by about 500 people, most of them Brazilian members of the sect, but also a smattering of local and international outsiders including physicians, psychiatrists, anthropologists, botanists, pharmacologists, and the like. There were about 20 North Americans invited, and I was among them. The conference started on a Tuesday and ended on a Saturday. After four days of lectures, slides, and much animated conversation, we were all well-primed and eager to experience the Waska beverage. A group session at the temple had been arranged for us on the final closing evening of the conference. This also corresponded with the regular schedule of the UDB, which customarily holds sessions on alternate Saturdays. On the night in question, the weather was humid and balmy. In the gathering dusk, we all walked a short distance from the dormitories where we had been staying to the temple about a quarter mile away nestled in a small valley. The regular members of the congregation, many of whom had attended the conference, but most of whom had driven out from the city for the evening's ritual, had already taken their places in the temple and were seated in comfortable reclining chairs arranged on terraces which completely encircled the interior of the temple. If any of you been to Brazil and drunk with the UDB, you know kind of what this setting was like. Uh, in the center of the amphitheater-like space, a long table was arranged with chairs arranged around it and a picture of Mr. Gabriel, the founder and prophet of the religion, was hung beneath an arch-shaped structure decorated with the sun, moon, and stars at one end. Several gallons of Waska tea, the, a brownish liquid the color of coffee latte, was in a plastic juice dispenser placed on the table beneath the picture of Mr. Gabriel. Beside it was a stack of paper picnic cups. A special set of chairs had been reserved for the visiting delegation of foreign dignitaries along one of the terrace-like elevations close to the center of the amphitheater. We threaded our way among the members already seated and took our places on the reserved spot. The officiating mestre and his acolytes, mostly men but including several women, were already seated around the table. After everyone had gotten settled, the mestre in charge rose to start dispensing the brew, held by a couple of his disciples. The members formed an orderly line. They all seemed to know just where and when to go, and there was no confusion or need for direction. And one by one, we filed down to stand before the mestre and be handed a paper cup containing our allotted draught. 
the size of the servings varied from person to person and seemed to be measured according to the body weight and the mestres assessing gaze. What other criteria were applied was not explained, but one got the feeling that he was taking the measure of the soul and spirit of the supplicant standing before him, as well as the body. Each person took the cup assigned to them and returned to stand in front of their chair, holding the cup. Once everyone had been served, the mestre gave a signal and all raised the cups to their lips and drained the bitter, foul-tasting beverage in two or three gulps. One of the Brazilian scientists standing next to me slipped me a small piece of dry ginger to kill the aftertaste, and I was grateful for the kind gesture. For about 45 minutes, everyone sat wrapped in their own thoughts. Absolute silence reigned. In a hall of over 500 people, you could have heard a pin drop. After this period, a few people began to get up and totter toward the bathrooms as the nausea, a frequent side effect in the early stages, began to take hold. You could hear the sounds of frequent of people puking and shitting emanating from the communal bathrooms at the back of the building. About the same time, the mestre began singing a beautiful song called Mata. And I thought I could not under, and though I could not understand the Portuguese words, the melody was quite moving. The sound of the heartfelt shamana mingling with the retching, gasping noises of people throwing up violently in the background <laughs> made me smile at the incongruity that no one else seemed to notice. My own experience was not developing as well. My stomach was queasy, but not enough to send me to the bathroom, and I felt restless and uncomfortable. I felt very little effect except for some brief flashes of hypnagogia behind my closed eyelids. I was disappointed. I had been hoping for more than a sub-threshold experience. And I didn't want to disappoint my hosts, who were concerned that their visitors should have a good experience and get it. When the mestre signaled that he was ready to give a second glass to anyone who wanted it, I was among the group of about a dozen gringos that queued up in front of the table. <laughs> Apparently, I was not the only one who was having a difficult time connecting with the spirit of the tea. I took my second drought. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> and settled back in my chair. It tasted, if possible, even worse than the first one had. Within a few minutes, it became clear that this time it was going to work. I began to feel the force of the waska course through my body, a feeling of energy passing from the base of my spine to the top of my head. It was like being born upwards in a high-speed elevator. I was familiar with this state of sympathetic activation from previous <coughs> mushroom experiences, and I welcomed the sensation as confirmation that the train was pulling out of the station. The energized feeling and the sensation of rapid acceleration continued. It was much like mushrooms, but seemed to be much stronger. I had the sense that this was one elevator it would be hard to exit from before reaching the top floor, whatever that might be. Random snippets of topics we had been discussing at the seminars in the previous days began to float into my consciousness. I remembered one seminar that had addressed the UDB's concept that the power of waska tea is a combination of force and light. The force was supplied by the monoamine oxidase inhibiting Banisteriopsis vine, known as Meriri in the local vernacular, while the light, the visionary hypnagogic component, was derived from Chakruna, the DMT containing Psychotria admixture plant. I thought to myself, what an apt characterization this was. Waska was definitely a combination of, oh, I thought this would work better, okay. Uh, Waska was definitely a combination of force and light. And at that moment, I was well within the grip of the force. And I hoped that I was about to break out into the light. At that instant, I had a thought. I, I had, at the instant I had that thought, I heard a voice seeming to come from behind my left shoulder. It said something like, you want to see force? I'll show you force. The question was clearly rhetorical, 
and I understood that I was about to experience something whether I wanted to or not.